Very excited to have everyone here learning from Dr. Ali Razai. My co-host is Dr. Allison Seebecker. I'm Siobhan Sarna. Hello, hello, hello all around and wishing you all the best of health. So before I get to Dr. Razai, I'm going to just expl explain who Dr. Allison Seebecker is. She is a award-winning, world-renowned SIBO specialist. She has helped thousands of patients resolve their SIBO through both clinical practice and also her course, a SIBO Recovery Roadmap. And then she has trained so many incredible professionals with the SIBO Pro course. On and on and on. Her website, SIBO Info, go there now. Well, watch this first. I have SIBO SOS. And we co-created the SIBO Recovery Roadmap course together, and I've written the book, Healing SIBO. Um, we have tons of free resources, SIBO SOS. Thank you. Now, Dr. Ali Razai. Dr. Razai works in California at Cedar sinai and I know that everyone's going to want to go see him after this discussion, so we'll find out if he's taking patients. He is the Director of Bioinformatics and Biotechnology at the MASS program, the Medically Associated Science and Technology program. You hear us talk about him all the time when we are also talking about his partner in healing, Dr. Mark Pimentel. Uh, this is a very special opportunity right now to learn about the research that they're doing that was revealed at DDW Digestive Disease Week 2025, and we have lots of questions for him, and we really appreciate you being here, sir. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me. So you glad know, you're we here. Love we love it. Our audience loves you and learning from you, and it's so hopeful, right? So there's lots and lots of hope. We're very impatient patients, Dr. Razai. so mm -hmm. help us. Help us to, to stand the ground and to remain hopeful until those treatments are a hundred percent. And I know you're working on them diligently. Dr. Seebecker, I'm going to hand things over to you so you can get us started with your, with some of your questions. Okay. Well, of course I wanted to bring up your uh, newest elemental diet study. Mm. Um, and it looked like this one focused mostly on um, methane and intestinal methanogen overgrowth. I got that right. right. And it looked like right. it was just another very successful study. So right. any, any comments you want to make about this one? Yeah, so I mean, just to go back, this was the elemental diet that was, this was the palatable elemental diet clinical trial that we did on 30 subjects. Just to uh, give you a little bit of a, a study design um, is that patients underwent seven days of screening. During that seven days of screening, uh, patients filled out uh, daily diaries, uh, took pictures of the poop throughout the whole study, uh, and uh, also gave us samples. Now we took blood, we took saliva, we took urine, we took like uh, breath VOCs, uh, and also stool. Now we are analyzing all these uh, as we go along. There was like so, uh, so we took a lot of biologic samples. And then patients were treated with two weeks of elemental diet uh, and exclusive. They couldn't drink uh, uh, any other drinks or eat anything else. And a little bit of a black coffee and a little bit of a uh, black tea were allowed and drinking water is, is okay. And this was Mbiota, right? Yes, this was Mbiota. And then after the Mbiota was finished at uh, after two weeks, then we follow the uh, patients for another two weeks to see what happens to them after reintroduction of, um, of food. Because uh, we wanted to see how uh, uh, whether uh, the symptoms that uh, improve, and then if, when we introduce food, whether symptoms starts to uh, worsen, which interesting enough, some of the symptoms continue to get better. In retrospect, if we knew that, we would have continued the follow-up way longer. Because, uh, you know, the common uh, follow-up after an intervention in IBS world uh, is about two weeks. So that's what we did. In this scenario, we should have done longer, but on the next study, we're going to do longer. Now, at each of these time points, patients provided stool. Uh, and we looked at this stool uh, at, um, uh, at uh, before the uh, embryota, after embryota, and then two weeks after. On top of it, every day, patients, when they woke up, they blew into these tiny uh, tubes and we measured the methane levels in that breath. So number one that we saw that uh, during the elemental diet treatment, within five days, actually, the methane levels drastically dropped. 
which is actually faster than antibiotics, which, uh, which number one, it tells you how powerful diet can be. Uh, and uh, number two is that, yes, uh, we can develop things other than antibiotics to treat this. That's very sort of, uh, uh, that's the ultimate goal, right? So at the end, uh, to stay away from empiric antibiotic for uh, for patients. But um, but also we follow patients uh, to see uh, what happens to the methane all throughout. So what we did is that we correlated the amount of methanogens present in the stool with the methane in these breath tests. And they correlated, right? So, because uh, one thing that we... Uh, very sure is that, okay, uh, we're decreasing the methane production drastically by elemental diet. Is it because, well, they didn't have substrate to produce methane, so they're like, okay, I'm going to sleep until uh, next time that I see food. Uh, and that turned out not to be the case because we uh, looked at the methanogens and they're in fact actually decreasing. The load is decreasing because even if they're sleeping, they're in dormancy, uh, we still pick them up, right, based on genetic markers uh, of these uh, organisms. No, and in, in fact, actually, we saw that actually they, they're going back to um, uh, the, uh, the uh, original state. Now, what, how does this happen? Uh, two scenarios. Uh, the one scenario is that, well, we're just essentially decreasing it. It's just, they're just dying because uh, of the elemental diet has some components that helps uh, you in terms of uh, almost um, uh, suppressing of the uh, of the growth. For example, MCT oils are known to decrease the, uh, uh, the the growth of some of the bacteria and archaea. So maybe that's it. But I think it's the other way around. It's actually uh, it's promoting the healthy growth of gut microbiome, and that healthy growth of microbiome and uh, goes back and tell the archaea, hey, you have no the room to be here, you should be, you should get out, right? And essentially that's factory setting gut microbiome uh, now uh, getting rid of the weed itself. So that's how it is. The reason why I say that, because the other changes that we saw in the stool microbiome is very similar to post hibernation animals. Believe it or not, there are some researchers working on animals who hibernate and their uh, microbiome, right? So they go collect stool uh, from that hungry bear that just woke up after six months. This study was done in Sweden uh, or Norway. Uh, and uh, they looked at the gut microbiome that of that uh, animal. And it actually was not surprisingly very healthy gut microbiome, right? But the changes that we saw after Mbiota was actually kind of similar to changes that we saw in those animals uh, post hibernation, uh, which is essentially a complete reset of the gut, right? Because they're not eating, right? Because one thing that is very important for the gut microbiome, every day uh, in our gut, the, the lining and epithelium sloughs, right? On a constant basis, right? Almost half a pound of your gut lumen sloughs and falls into your gut, right? So even if you're not eating at all, there is some food that goes through in the form of your own uh, flesh going through, right? Uh, the beauty of that is that our normal native gut microbiome survives on that, thrives on that, but the invasive bacteria, the overgrown bacteria and archaea can't survive on that. They need food, right? So when that phenomenon happens, whether in, through intermittent fasting, whether through hibernation, uh, whether through elemental diet, uh, that uh, native bacteria can survive, the invasive bacteria dies. And that native bacteria that grows back in even further pushes out the overgrown bacteria because that's their preferable environment now, right? So that's, that's the beauty of it. Now, if you continue overeating, uh, like that bear that is supposed to do, because now they eat everything in their path, right? Pre-hibernation uh, gut microbiome is not necessarily that healthy. And in fact, that they have put the poop uh, of a pre-hibernation um, bear 
into mice and mice get fat and unhealthy mm -hmm. and post hibernation uh, poop they put it in mice and they get fit uh, so but well bears have to do that so this this cycle happens uh, and I think that's what we're triggering and this is where I think uh, like elemental diet now and biota in this scenario and intermittent fasting and hibernation all of a sudden are linking up uh, for the uh, gut microbiome health. You know, that is so fascinating. I think most, most of us had thought the mechanism with elemental diet was that it just starved the overgrown microbes mm. to death. Yes. But this is a whole different viewpoint. I'm loving it. Yes. So no, so we were, we were expecting complete, like, you know, complete suppression of bacteria and archaea post-elemental diet. That was not the case at all. And in fact, actually the breath testing uh, uh, didn't completely become flat. It switched from, for example, a high, well, methane dropped obviously all throughout the test, but the, the peak of um, the hydrogen in SIBO patients didn't completely go away. It's actually shifted towards the cold, which is the normal, right? So if it was about only starvation, wiping them out, no, that was not the case. You wouldn't have seen the colonic peak. We did, uh, we did see the col uh, colonic peak. So it's essentially switching a small intestinal overgrown bacterial picture to a normal colonic fermenting bacteria uh, where su they're supposed to be pictured. Uh, so it's kind of resets the gut rather than uh, wiping it out. Uh, yeah, I know. All throughout the years, in the last 20 years, we thought we were wiping them out. That was not the case, uh, which is very fascinating. And we're seeing it in, in the stool as well, not just the breath test. Yeah, and, and better than we could have hoped for. This is yes. excellent. <laughs> yes. Like, yes. Yes. So now we, now we know a method that can truly help dysbiosis, even whether, you know, whether it's SIBO, EMO, ESO, or something else even. Absolutely. So th this is this is the thing, right? So uh, the SIBO and EMO are just two subcategories, right? So the whole dysbiosis, uh, if you think about it, yes, can we uh, like have an intervention uh, that can uh, sort of reset the gut? Uh, so that's, that's potentially uh, that can happen, right? For example, in the past, we did know intermittent fasting, but I mean, you know, how long can you do intermittent fasting forever? Uh, you know, you can't do that, right? Um, but, and, and also intermittent fasting, because the cycles of um, sloughing of the gut is about five days, right? The lining of the gut is, it takes five days and it doesn't happen at each segment uh, all the time, right? So you need one and a half cycles, about eight days. That's the magic number to reset the gut at least. Uh, and uh, so that's uh, that's what we saw, for example, uh, uh, that's probably where uh, you get a reset of your gut. But you can't do it for just this, just eight days. It's, well, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, technically you can. Uh, so that's the minimum that you should do uh, to get that uh, reset for sure. Um, uh, but the thing is that for intermittent fasting, well, you can't fast for eight days, right? So right. this is kind of... Right. No, uh, I'm just talking about the embiota. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for embiota, eight days potentially... Uh, is the magic number. So we are planning, hopefully, to do a another study in healthy individuals uh, to test that timeline to see, okay, when is the uh, the point that you see that beautiful gut reset, uh, sort of, um, and eight days based on the preliminary data is is probably the time, but we'll check it. And and also, you saw a reduction of visceral fat too. Absolutely. So that's that's actually so that that's one of the things that we looked at uh, when we looked at okay how many days is uh, enough because we checked in some of the subjects uh, almost every day we checked the visceral fat right uh, it was tedious but we did it um, but looked like uh, like the visceral fat because uh, you know in total at the end about eleven percent visceral fat uh, loss was seen. Almost 10% of like 10, uh, you know, 10% loss happened within the first eight days, right? And then the other six days was, a, was just 1%. So it 
So that shows that that goes like this. It's not like continuous like that. It was almost exponential. So that was one of the time points that uh, popped up that the eight days might be the uh, magic number. It's interesting because, you know, uh, the original study that uh, Mark and team did on elemental diet, you know, they some some folks didn't clear the SIBO at 14 days mm -hmm. and then they went on to 21 days. And we do see this clinically. Some people do do right. need longer. Um, how does that fit into this? Because I wouldn't want people to automatically think, oh, I only need eight days and that's right. it. We do see. That's what I'm sitting here thinking. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, I, and, and, and I was contemplating about that. And I think the answer is how much elemental diets have come along. If you think about it, uh, Vivonex Plus, the formulation goes back to late 80s. Uh, so it was just Vivonex in 70s and uh, all the way to mid 80s and then Y1X plus came in and it hasn't been updated yet right yeah. and that study was done with Y1X uh, plus so if you look at for example Y1X plus it has LCT oil it has uh, so it's things that modern elemental diets don't necessarily need to have it the technology on purifying uh, uh, amino acids have drastically changed. Uh, so that's another sort of important thing. Uh, the purifying MCT oils have drastically changed. Uh, so now we use MCT oils in uh, elemental diet. So Y1X uh, is not necessarily the same as in Biota. Uh, so maybe that's why uh, that we had to go longer with a Y1X uh, as opposed to the modern elemental diets such as in Biota that seems to do the trick faster uh, than, than that. I mean, there was actually a recent study, again, with Vivonex. It's not just Mark's study uh, that was done by um, the Chicago group. And this was done in uh, eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders. Mm -hmm. uh, these are EGIT patients. And they had to do six weeks of it uh, to see response. Six weeks exclusive elemental diet. I mean, that's that's challenging. Uh, and But I think 15 patients were, were, uh, were able to finish it. So yeah, so that's the thing. So the modern elemental diets uh, like Ambiota is uh, are another beast clearly. As, as, as you compare it to the first generation of elemental diets, right? The Vibonex versus Vibonex Plus. Vibonex Plus was like a huge uh, revolution, uh, but it hasn't changed in the last, two and a half decades, yeah, more, three decades, yeah. And in Ambiota, the MCT oil is just built into the formula, right? Yes. You don't have yes. to add it. So that that's really nice. Yes. That's really nice, yeah.